Hi everyone, I'm Lori Adams. I'm the CEO at Women for Women International, and I am really excited to be doing this Hope Beyond the Headlines interview with Sean Sherman from our Iraq program. I got a chance to meet Sean uh, out in Kurdistan region of Iraq a couple of years ago, and although I'd rather be there in person, it's such fun uh, to reconnect here via Zoom and to share a conversation with all of you about Sean and the work she's been doing. Hello, everyone. So Sean is the Economic Empowerment Manager in our Iraq program. Um, and as you may have been following, in the last few months, COVID-19 really has been affecting Iraq, as it has been all of us, but in a way that has really led to quite a strong uh, shutdown. And our team has been doing just incredible things to find out how to keep reaching women. And um, I am so excited to start off by asking Sharon, can you please give us an update on life in Iraq? What is happening with the program? What is happening with the women we serve? Thank you so much, Laurie. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. And um, as you mentioned, when you were saying that in the beginning, the lockdown was very strict and tough. But fortunately now, things have been going back slowly into normal life. We can see restaurants opening up uh, and uh, there is a lot of movement going on. People are going out of their houses. So it has been going really well on that side. And for our participants as well, uh, we, we still have ongoing online classes for those participants who are able to come to the online classes. And right now we're in the middle of regrouping the women and having them in class hopefully on October 1st. Uh, that's for the participants in Shawis and Sheikhan and for our Syrian refugee participants in Basirma camp. They have already started their classes. That's they right. have started with social empowerment. They're learning their numbers in economic empowerment. So uh, it's, it's amazing to see that energy in the classes. But Sean, let me take us back to something because you skipped over it really quickly. You just took it for granted. Oh yes, our online classes. But wait, we work with mostly non-literate women at distance who have very little access to technology and nowhere else in the 27 year history of Women for Women, nor in any other part of the world, have we had online classes. So tell us a little bit more. How did you go from face-to-face -face curriculum that we've been innovating for so long to online classes? What did that take? Uh, honestly, it took a lot of effort, enthusiasm, and innovation to do that. We, we were already checking with our women. In the beginning, we noticed that this is a very difficult time for everyone. So we decided to stay in touch with the participants that we have, around 1,050 women, and to check on them to see if they're abiding by the guidelines, the health guidelines issued by the government and WHO, to see how they're doing. And while we were speaking to them, we noticed that some of them that are talking about accessing to internet, having smartphone, and then we said, well, maybe we can take advantage of that. What can we do about it? Then we developed a survey to went back to all of the women and asked, is this your phone number? Do you have a smartphone? Do you have access to internet? Are you willing to participate in an online class? And um, from there, we had our own database and looked at more than half of the women were willing and were excited to participate in the online classes. And uh, we started to, uh, to look into what kind of platform should we use? That was also addressed in the survey. Some of them had access to Viber, some of them had access to WhatsApp. And we decided to go based on the needs and the accessibility of the women. We have groups of Vibers, we have groups of WhatsApp. And then one thing that has been very concerning to women, is, especially in Iraq, it's about regarding their phone numbers because sometimes when men get their phone numbers, they tend to harass them, they tend to call them annoy them and we were afraid about that honestly uh, so we decided to take um, a proactive measure and say okay we have ground rules in place if you participate in this group the phone numbers that are in this group that you can see must remain in this group you're not allowed to leak these phone numbers and know there's going to be consequences if that happens so we came up with ground rules and as you mentioned some of them are literate and some of them are illiterate so the way we're doing it was uh, we are, and we, 
we presented the ground rules to them. We did it in writing in both Arabic and Kurdish. Also, we did it in voice messages. So those who can't read and write can listen to it and to learn oh, what are the ground rules. And from there, we, we developed schedules. The trainers started delivering classes. Some of them are doing it by voice message. Some of them are recording their, themselves in a video form and sharing it with the women. It's just phenomenal. You're like pioneering cybersecurity for the organization. You're adapting the curriculum. Earlier uh, last week, you were saying about how you also figured out how the pedagogy, how to make it more interactive. So I just, uh, it's definitely one of those examples of how things we didn't even think were possible were made possible by your incredible innovation. But there's another thing that's a bit new, and this isn't completely new to Women for Women. We used to do this a lot, but it's been a while since we've worked in a refugee camp because we've really prioritized working in host communities. Um, so we work with Syrian refugees primarily in host communities before, you know, working alongside Iraqis and Iraqi displaced as well. Um, so is there anything different, uh, but it is quite exciting that you're now working in the refugee camp. Is there anything different about that? Yes. Uh, when we were working within the host community with Syrian refugees, they, they tend to move around very much because uh, of income, because of job opportunities, because of the rent. If they found a cheaper house, they would move from this location to another location. It was very difficult to keep them intact and to keep them in the program. But right now, when we see them and we go into the, the camp, they're all there, they come to participate, they're very excited, they're using their COVID protective measures. We can see that uh, in Chavez, we made masks. The, we had voluntary women who came into the center according to a schedule that we developed, and they were coming sewing masks. Now their sisters are using those masks in Basra camp in order to stay, uh, it, to protect themselves from COVID and be able to attend classes. The vibe is just different because some, of, some organizations moved out of the camps. They didn't have many uh, activities and many educational program going on. So we were warmly welcomed by the women in the camp. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it was for a while in Women for Women's History, we didn't work in refugee camps precisely because the program is a year long. It's designed to set up businesses. Uh, but we certainly realized with the Syrian refugee crisis in particular, and I'm, I'm sure everyone with us has heard this, that you know the average time that someone is in a refugee camp is decades, not months. And so um, really needing to help people uh, find a life and a home in that camp, um, unfortunately. But I want to talk about something else now, Sean, and that is women's leadership. That's the theme of this uh, fall, autumn, uh, hope beyond the headline series is women's leadership. And uh, women's leadership is a really, really important part of Women for Women program. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen women step up as leaders after going through the program or even during the program? Oh my God, we can see them become leaders within months after participating in the program. When, when we did Message to My Sister series and they were introducing themselves as I am the leader of the saving group. This definition changed for I from I'm vulnerable, I need help, I need this, to define herself as a leader of a saving group which has 25 women in it which is the responsibility of looking after the money, making sure that the money is safe, that everyone's money is counted for. So I have seen a lot of leaders coming out of this program. I have seen women whose husband was in prison. She had to take charge and look after her children, spend money on them, make sure they are going to school. Well, she, when she said in the beginning, she was planning to drop her kids out of school because she thought she couldn't uh, spend money on them to go to school. But after participating in the program, she realized, no, I can do this. And it's very important for their future to do this. I have seen women, especially during COVID, that we saw a lot of women taking leadership and say, my husband lost his job. He was out of job. My husband was a taxi driver and everything was locked down. I had to do something. I went out and got a job in a factory or in a salon or in anywhere else. We have another woman who said we had one sack of flour in the house. Now I have turned that sack of flour into eight sacks of flour by making bread for people because during that time some of the bakeries were also shut, shut down. So she took advantage of that opportunity and started making bread from her home, sending, taking it to other people who asked for it. Now she has a revenue and inventory of eight sacks of flour. 
It's so interesting, John. It's so interesting that you uh, mention economic power as part of women's leadership. I, you know, one of the things I think is so powerful about Women for Women's program is that often women's leadership programs are all about just speaking up and advocating. And that is really, really important. Um, and women feeling confident to speak up is really important. But a key part of Women for Women's program is to say having social power, being connected to other women, having, you know, internal power, power within that you feel confident, but having power to do stuff with, because you have access to income and because you can see yourself thriving in a business. It's a really important part of women's leadership. That's true. And Shana, um, you yourself are also a leader, a leader that inspires me every time I get a chance to speak to you and I'm sure inspires the women. Um, uh, but I'm sure it wasn't, uh, so you come across as a natural leader, but I'm sure it, the journey hasn't always been easy. Can you talk about yourself as a leader? What inspires you? What have you learned about being a leader? What barriers did you have to overcome um, in your own leadership journey? I have been very lucky that um, from the beginning when I started working, I was able to work in a field that was also my passion. And uh, to answer what inspires me to be a leader is definitely empowering women in any level that is possible. Empowering women inspires me to keep going and to make sure that I am living up to my purpose in life and to my calling in life. So it's, it has not been easy. It's still an ongoing journey, I have to admit. I still have things to work on myself. We as women tend to to be very harsh on ourselves, not to be kind on ourselves. We tend to be very critical and uh, not take risks when most of the time. So it took a while for me to be able to say, okay, I can do this. I don't have to meet what is required 100%. I can do it. And as I'm going, I can learn it. I can be kind on myself when I'm tired. I can pause and I can pick myself up and try again and do this again. So it hasn't been it hasn't been easy as I mentioned. It's still an ongoing it's still an ongoing an ongoing journey, and uh, uh, what inspires me definitely is empowering women. I read a lot about leadership, about management, to make sure that I'm being a fair manager in my job, and above all, we have men allies as well in the community. As long as we are willing to look at them and ask for their supports and uh, to to work with each other. But what's the most important thing for me and I have learned through working and I have learned this from experience is when you have another female leader in your group, if you are not in competition with her, you are completing each other. You are there for the greater purpose, which is empowering women. So as long as you both make it clear that we're doing this for the women and we're doing this for our greater mission that we believe in, we're not in competition rather than we have to complete each other, then that's when I found true success. And I've been able to do that with my coworker and it has been going really, really well. And it wasn't at the first time, it took a little bit of time to, to create this trust and to create this harmony of working with each other. So one of the things that helps you keep going in the tough times, and let's admit 2020 has not been a, uh... The easiest year for anybody um, is this sisterhood that you have with your peer uh, female colleagues uh, what what else what are the other you know forms of support you've had in your in your life are there family members I mean what what made it possible for you perhaps more than someone else to to step forward and be the leader that you are I, I have had a very supportive parents my mother and my father they have really supported me and uh, part of working with women and empowering women has been seeing myself having a strong mother to support me. I believe that a strong mother goes a long way. She supports her daughter and makes sure that her daughter can access the rights that she has. If it wasn't for my mother, I would not have been able to go and study abroad. I would not have been able to get into this field. I got interested in women's empowerment field when I was 16, reading her magazine, which she was buying about women's rights and noticing that there are a lot of injustice going on. I need to do something about it. So definitely the credit mostly goes to my mother for being such a wonderful woman and proving herself that she can stand in the face of any challenge and it just succeed in life. 
That's fantastic. That's my story too. My, my mom um, read Ms. Magazine in the 70s and so free to be you and me was something I grew up in. Even if my mom's own life um, was constrained, she passed along an ideal and a vision. And that's part of our program too, because we don't work with children except through the mothers and the women in the program. And we've seen so many instances of family members of the women who are directly in our program being inspired and by the women in our program sharing what they've learned with their daughters and the importance of, of girls' education. Um, so that leads me to another question, which is, you know, how uh, can we invest more in women's leadership? What does that support look like? If, if we're looking into it as an individual, as me and you, it's supporting women authors, reading their books and not putting them down praising them for the good that they have done in that book, looking into their, the effort they've put in it to it. It's supporting a woman entrepreneur who has opened a small shop and going to her and buying things from her. It's supporting at every single little levels. We don't have to, to dream big and ask for millions of millions and say, okay, this is gonna make it happen. It's us doing it and make sure that those women feel supported because a small purchase we might not think it has a lot of impact, but if I do it and another person does it and another person does it, that eventually leads into something for that entrepreneur or that author or that person who is standing up. It's not letting each other down and supporting each other because unfortunately in the society that I have grown up in is if you want to prove that you are a good female, you need to put the other females down to prove that you are worthy of a female of the name of the leader or a name that you've done good, you have to put someone else down, but no, we have to prove the community wrong and say, that's not how it works. I'm supporting my sister. I'm supporting this woman who has started this job or who has done, taken this initiative and done this job. So it no, definitely it's, it's... comes from individual efforts. No, and uh, you know, I recently read some research. There's this whole idea that, um, women do put each other down or have to put each other down. And it sounds like it's, it was quite strong in the community you grew up in, but it's interesting because I did read some research that said that it's, um, it's such a nice notion that women do that to each other, but that actually, uh, at least in the research that they did, the majority of women do support each other and that it is not as common as sometimes people think, this notion that women put each other down. And so it's, and it's fantastic to see movements building of women supporting each other in sisterhood. But I want to ask you, so you mentioned um, reading other women's books and right now I'm reading Isabel Wilkinson's Warmth of Other Sons and it's just, oh my God, I'm in awe. She just interviewed thousands and thousands of people and did this most incredible piece of research um, showing a part of the history in the United States that many people don't know. So that's, that's the, the woman that I'm reading right now that's inspiring me. What about you? What are you reading that's inspiring you from other women? I was able to, um, to read my mom's book, which she, uh, she last published before she passed away. Oh. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see it, but in her book, she goes and interviews women who have retired. And she has interviewed around 30 women and gathered all the experience that they have. And in that way, in that book, you can see a lot of initiatives, a lot of kindness that has happened because Iraq went through a very difficult time for a very long time. And these, in her role as a teacher, one of the women she interviewed in her role as a teacher, she would take little sandwiches for her classroom. So students, she knew they were hungry. They were able to focus on her classes. And then there were like nurses being interviewed, doctors being interviewed, engineers being interviewed different things just to go and gather everything in there and learn from those experiences was the most amazing thing. I'm too late to say this. Uh, I just have started reading I Am Malala and um, I, I am enjoying it so far. I, I should have read it a long time ago, but life just did not allow me to, but I'm so glad that I'm in that process right now. And I got that book from one of my colleagues. Well, one of the things I read was that abolish all shoulds uh, from, from your thinking. Either you want to do it or you don't and there shouldn't be blame or shame and it sounds like Malala's book came to you at the time you needed it but also what a gift but also how hard Sean to uh, see this beautiful gift of your mother's book and, and to read it and to to both be able to see insight into her work but then not have her here so I just mm -hmm. 
what a what a beautiful but difficult gift and uh our heart our hearts are with you um thank just, you so much yeah so um i i think that's just beautiful that we support women's businesses that we um read women's literature that we support each other um so my final question to you what does the future look like if more women are in power oh. very colorful <laughs> I would say we would have a higher rate of education, um, definitely less conflict, less radicalization of individuals, because um, mothers love their children, and if they have power within their households, they're definitely not going to let their kids to go and be radicalized and harm themselves and other people. We would have definitely more, more educated people, which leads to having a more harmonious community that we live in. The, um, a world would be a much better place if we have more empowered women, definitely. That's, that's beautiful. And it also gives us a reminder of the context that you're working in, that radicalization and what happens to children um, and how that leads to conflict is forefront of your mind. Um, and it's actually a really relevant theme for the U.S. right now as well as we see our country um, being more and more polarized and uh, armed militias out on the street. So there's much to learn from um, all that you all are doing in Iraq and have done to bring people together and, and to bring peace and to invest in women for women's leadership. And Sean, I just wanna end by thanking you so much for joining me here today. I don't wanna take too much time because I want you back out there. I know that classes, face-to-face -face classes are restarting this week. I know there just must be so much work because you have to figure out how to do it differently at distance, make sure everybody stays safe. Um, and uh, I, I just really wanna thank you for your work. And to everybody who has joined us, uh, please, if you would like to follow the work of Sean, uh, go to our website at Women for Women. And uh, you can follow Sean on Instagram as well, uh, Sean Sherman, and, um, and just keep being inspired by the incredible work being done. Thank you, Sean. And thank, thank you, you all so of much. you for joining us.